no matter uh, who you are, what your involvement has been here over the last 10 years, I hope that everybody in this room, I hope it's crystal clear to everybody here that God is about to do something big right here in this community. Right here in this church, something big is about to happen. We have come to a precipice. We've come to a big moment on the horizon, like a doorway. We're about to pass through into a new era. And when these moments come to us in our faith, these moments that are big, these moments that are so big that we think it must be God, it has to be God because it's so big. When those moments approach us in our faith, I want to encourage everybody in this room to treat those moments like a blessing. Because if your faith is, is anything like mine, and your walk with God has been anything like mine, there, there are a lot of times where I wish that the voice was louder. You know, I, I wish that the, the presence that I was seeking with God was stronger. I wish that the will of God that I was trying to discern in my own life and the life of the people that I love was just a little bit clearer. And sometimes in, in, in the worst moments, you know, it feels like you're almost grasping at air, like, like what if there's nothing there? But then there are moments, and they're rare, but these big moments where you know it's God, you know it's his voice, and you know that the moment is big. And when those moments come, when you feel yourself in the midst of a moment like that, the, the one thing that I want to urge you towards, that I want to encourage you to do is, is don't miss it. Don't miss those moments. These are big, rare, transformative moments. And, and I, I don't want you to miss this. You know, when I was a, a sophomore in college, I, uh, I was playing baseball at Xavier. And at the end of my sophomore fall season, and, and the fall was this time where we would compete against our own teammates. And you would compete against each other for three months in order to see who was going to start and who was going to be the backup and who wasn't going to play at all and what the depth chart was going to be. And at the end of this, you know, fierce grind of a three-month competition, our coaches would bring us into a room <laughs> individually with all the coaches there and they would sit us down and they would tell us where we stood. It was like a very dramatic moment, you know, anxiety-inducing. And I remember walking into the room my sophomore year after the fall and I was scared to death. And they sat me down and they said, John, you have earned the starting position on this team. And I was really, really relieved. And whenever you have severe anxiety and you get relief from that anxiety, your body gets flooded with like endorphins and feel-good chemicals from your brain. And it's very hard to focus. Now, I don't really remember what the coaches were saying, but one of them snapped me out of it. And they were like, John, how do you think the team's going to be this year? What do you think this year holds for us? And in all of my ability to like articulate on the spot as a 19-year-old, I was like, good? My, good is my answer? And they're like, you're going to have to give me more than that. And I don't remember what I said, but I remember that I was talking, and at one point one of the coaches cut me off, and he said, John, the team this year is going to be special. This is different. This is a special team, and this team is going to do things that Xavier Baseball has not done in a very long time. What you do with this opportunity is up to you. And I remember that that struck me so strongly in that moment because that's not usually the way that coaches talk to athletes. You know, that's not usually the way that, that the motivational systems work to, to try to pull greatness out of somebody. Usually the team is used as a chip. And so it's kind of like... Um, you know, if you perform, if you transcend, then the team has an opportunity to transcend, so don't let your brothers down. We need your performance, we need your achievement. But in this moment, they flipped the script on me, really for the first time in my athletic career, and, and they said it differently. And what they said was that the moment is here. It's already happening. It's not something that you have to create. It's here. Don't miss it. Don't miss this moment. And for us in this church community, that kind of moment has, has come upon us because sure enough, that year, we did things that Xavier Baseball had not done in a very long time, but that Xavier Baseball has done many times since. And it was like the coaches were sitting in that room and they could feel that this moment was upon us, that we were about to walk through a door into a new era and they looked me in the eyes as a 19-year-old and they said, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss what's about to happen. This is going to be special. And for us in this community, that kind of moment is here. That kind of moment is upon us because we are going to open the doors to a new building. And just because we open the doors, forget about whether we deserve it, forget about whether we're good at what we do. Just because we open the doors to that building, thousands of people are going to show up looking to hear about the person of Jesus Christ. 
And that moment is approaching us right now. And, and in this church, we have 400 some people who are part of our squad, team members, who make this place go. And every person who gives their life to Christ, every person who takes a step towards Jesus, all of our squad is front and center in the story of that person, in the story of that life, in the story of that soul. And so when we open the doors and thousands of people come in, there's so much opportunity for us to be a part of those stories. And so if you're in the room today, we are calling you to join the squad. We're calling you to not miss this moment. Don't miss what God has for you and the way that he wants to move through you in this moment, in this city, in this community right now. And one of the hesitations that, that people often have is they're not quite sure how they're supposed to be used. You know, they don't know exactly what they have to give. They don't know exactly what gifts or talents or where God wants them or how they'll contribute. And so what I want to do today is I want to walk through the stories of four heroes of our faith in the scriptures. And there's this really strange consistency in these stories. And what I want us to notice is that what happens to these men of faith when a moment gets big and when the voice of God becomes clear and when it's so big that it has to be God. I want you to see how these men respond in that moment and then I want that to become the paradigm or the pattern or the model for how we, in this big moment where God's going to do something amazing, how we respond to the call of God, how we respond to the moment that God has put in front of us. I'm going to tell you guys a story about Abraham and I'm going to tell you a story about Moses and I'm going to tell you a story about the prophet Isaiah and finally I'm going to tell you a story about a guy you might not know from the New Testament named Ananias. And I want you to watch what happens when the moment gets big, when the voice of God becomes clear, when the call is heard. And I want you to see how they respond, and I want you to see what God does through that response. And then we as a church are about to emulate that over the next few months in this big moment that's happening right here. And so we begin with the story of Abraham, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 22. And uh, Abraham is a very special character in the Bible. Because if you read the story of scripture, what you realize is that on page one and two, the world is whole and it's good and it's the way it ought to be. And page three, it becomes broken. And then the whole story from that point on, thousands and thousands of pages, is a story about how God is going about restoring and healing and making the world whole once again. And the way that he chooses to do it is he chooses to go through one man. He calls one man, his name is Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And then through that nation, there will be provision and blessing. And then through that nation, the whole world is going to be blessed and the world will be redeemed and set back to rights. Now what that means is that Abraham is going to have children and then his children are going to have children and so on and so forth until there's a nation of people. Uh, and the problem is that Abraham and his wife Sarah have never been able to have kids and now they're old and so for years, the promise is out there, but it's unfulfilled because they cannot have children. And through the miraculous work of God, they have a child. And they name this son Isaac. And Isaac means laughter because when God told these old people that they were going to conceive and have a child so that his promises could continue, they laughed. And so they have Isaac. And now the promises of God, the restoration of the world, go through Isaac, this son. And in Genesis chapter 22, we read this. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he doesn't know what God's going to ask him to do. And he doesn't know what God has in store for him. And he doesn't know if he's equipped for the job, but he hears the voice, he feels the moment, he knows it's God, and he presents himself available. Here I am. My yes is on the table. I don't want to miss this moment. And what God asks Abraham to do is something that's unthinkable to us. He asks him to sacrifice his son. And what you have to understand contextually is that before Abraham met God, this God, Yahweh, he worshipped all the other gods like all the other people, the pagan gods. And the relationship between the pagan gods and people was one of appeasement. And so when you're appeasing a god, the, the natural outcome as you take that to its extreme is that you will sacrifice what's most important to you, which is your child. And so child sacrifice was something that people did with gods. So Abraham has met this God, Yahweh, and he asked him to do something that's very common amongst the God's requests for people. And he takes uh, Isaac up to the top of the mountain, and he's about to sacrifice him. 
And it says this, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he, res- and he responded once again, here I am. He doesn't know what's going to be asked. He doesn't know if he has what it takes. He doesn't know what's about to happen. But he hears the voice of God. He feels the moment. It's gotten big. And he says, I don't want to miss this moment. I don't want to miss what God has for me right now. And what God does in this moment is something that Thomas Cahill, who's a scholar and wrote an amazing book called The Gift of the Jews, says is a moment that that altered the history of world religion. It's a moment that changed the relationship between man and God forever because in this moment God provides a ram and he says, I'm not going to have you do this. This is not the kind of relationship that we have. This is not the kind of God that I am. I'm a God of promise. I'm a God of covenant faithfulness. I'm a God of life. And so you're not going to do this. And he gives them another way. And so think about that. For the rest of history, we think of of God as the kind of God who would never ask us to do something like that. And it all changed in this one moment. The history of world religion, the history of thought, the history of faith shifts dramatically in this one moment. And Abraham is front and center of revealing the character of this God that you and I worship. Why is Abraham able to be in that moment? Why is he able to be the conduit that God communicates his character to us? Not because of his gifts, not because of his talents, not because he was prepared, but because he heard the voice and he felt the moment and he said, I'm not going to miss this moment. Moses. You guys know the story of Moses, right? It's the story of the Exodus. And the Exodus is this moment in, that, that's paradigmatic in our faith of how God saves us. Because uh, Moses, the Exodus, is a story where the people of Israel, the, the offspring of Abraham, are enslaved in Egypt under the most powerful man and the most powerful empire that the world had ever seen. And the Exodus is where this nation of slaves, this group of slaves, flees and escapes into freedom, the most powerful army in the world. And it's this huge moment in history. And Moses is the leader of this moment. But how did he come to be the leader of the moment? How did he come to be in in charge of this moment in the history of God's redemptive purposes? Well, in Exodus chapter 3, you see that that Moses is herding sheep in the desert because he's outcast from the city. So he's not even welcome in the city. He's herding herding his flock. And he sees a bush. And the bush is on fire. But although it's on fire... It's not burning up. It's not being consumed. And he says, I must go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And he turns his attention to the burning bush. And it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called to him from out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Just like Abraham. I don't know what you're going to ask me to do. I don't know what this has for me. I don't know what this moment is. But I hear the voice. I feel the moment. And I'm available. Here I am. I'm not going to miss it. And so what God asked him to do is absurd, right? To deliver a nation of slaves from the most powerful man, most powerful nation that's ever existed to that time is a crazy thing. When, when Moses actually hears the call and understands what the mission is, he's like, I can't even talk very well. How do you want me to go do something like this? But he felt the moment. And he said, I'm not going to miss this. And Moses goes on to lead this nation of slaves into freedom. And like I said, this becomes the paradigm, the pattern, the model, the type of the way that God saves his people. So much so that when Jesus goes up on a cross and in his death frees us from all slavery of sin and evil and darkness and death, he chooses to do it on Passover weekend, which is a celebration of the Exodus. And Moses' name is forever attached to this moment in salvation history where we start to understand who our God is and how he saves. Why does Moses get to be a part of that? Why is his name etched into this moment of redemptive history? It's not because of his gifts. It's not because of his talent. It's not because of his history. It's because he heard the voice. He felt the call. And he felt the moment get big. And he said, God's about to do something. And and, and I don't want to miss this. The, The prophet Isaiah Uh, This was a prophet in in the Old Testament, um, and he's called to be a prophet in a dream, which is strange. And in his dream, he finds himself in the Holy of Holies of the temple, which is where the presence of God dwells, the, the glory of God, and you're not supposed to be in there. The only person who's allowed to go in there is the high priest, the leader of the faith, once a year. And Isaiah finds himself an unclean man in the middle 
of the glory of God. And he has this terrifying encounter with God in his dream. And then it says this, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. Just like Abraham. Just like Moses. Before he knows what his call is. Before he knows what the task is. He hears the voice. He hears the call. He feels the moment. And he said, I don't want to miss this moment. What God asked Isaiah to do is crazy. He says, uh, here's your call. You will be forever speaking to these people and they will never understand you. You will be forever calling them to faithfulness and these stiff-necked, dull-hearted people will not listen to you and you will watch these people get destroyed by an enemy because of their lack of faith. That is a bad call. It's a bad calling to have. But he does it. And sure enough, he's presented himself as available. He said, here I am, send me. And he goes on this mission and he is rejected by his people and he does watch his own people get taken away into exile and slavery by the Assyrians. But in the midst of all of that, he starts to prophesy and speak and foretell of a coming king, a Messiah, and what this Messiah is going to look like. And he adds an element to this idea of a future king that is very different and very fresh. Instead of talking about a king who's going to come with power and might and violence, and free people the way that kings would free people, he starts to talk about a suffering servant who's going to come and he's going to bleed and he's going to die. And in that death and in that suffering, at the hands of the very people that he's come to save, they'll be freed. Have you ever heard the verse, by his wounds we have been healed? That's a prophecy of Isaiah. And these words from this prophet become so important that when Jesus comes on the scene, you start to listen to the words that he speaks And you start to hear the scripture that he quotes. And it's almost like Jesus understands his own calling specifically through the words of the prophet Isaiah. And so the utterances of Isaiah become some of the most important utterances that anybody in the people of God have ever said. It's the way that we recognize Jesus as king. It's the way that we see a savior on the cross and say, that's him, that's the king. How does Isaiah end up being attached to a moment like that, to those kinds of words of weight? It's not because of his talent. It's not because of his skill. It's not even because he was at the right place at the right time. It's because there was a moment. And the moment got big and the voice got clear. And Isaiah said, I'm not going to miss this. Whatever God has in store for me, I'm not going to miss it. The last character is a man named Ananias. And you might not know who Ananias is. He's in the book of Acts, very briefly. But you know who he's connected to. He's connected to Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul. And when we meet Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts, he's a Pharisee, a zealous Pharisee who is trying to squelch this movement of people who are claiming that the Messiah is a dead man. Because the Messiah was supposed to come and be glorious and triumphant, and he was supposed to free them from the Romans. So the fact that Jesus went up on the cross and died at the hands of the Romans means that he's not the Messiah. And so Paul was hearing people preaching that, yeah, he died, but he resurrected. And he said, that is a toxic belief And we have to stamp it out even violently. And Paul oversees the stoning of Stephen. And it says that he's wreaking havoc on the church. And he goes up to Damascus in Syria because he's going to do the same thing. And on his way, he's knocked off of his horse and he becomes blind and paralyzed. And he has a face-to-face encounter with the risen Jesus. And from that moment forward, his life is different. Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles, one of the most important figures in the Christian faith. But the problem is that he's lying on the side of the road, injured and blind. And Jesus, or Jesus says, you're going to go into the city, and you're going to meet a man there named Ananias. And he's a disciple, and he's going to nurse you back to health. And at the same time, we hear this. Now, there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Just like Abraham, just like Moses, just like Isaiah. The moment gets big, he hears the voice. And he doesn't know what God's going to ask. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do yet. But he feels that moment. He says, I'm not going to miss it. Here I am. What do you have for me? My yes is on the table. And Ananias ends up nursing Paul back to health, which is a crazy thing to ask somebody to do. Right, Because Paul is a man who's been murderously oppressing people just like Ananias because of what Ananias believes. When he hears the call, when he hears what God actually wants him to do, he's like, I don't think that's a good idea. It might kill me. But in that moment, he feels the moment. He says, I don't want to miss it. And I'm available to whatever you have for me right here. You're about to move, and I don't want to miss this. 
And Ananias becomes connected to one of the most important leaders in the early church. The, 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 the key missionary, the key pastor, the key theologian, the key writer of the early church. The way that, that the Gentiles were exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The way that it spread throughout the world and conquered an empire. Ananias is front and center in that movement, in that moment. Not because of his skill. It doesn't say anything about his talent. It doesn't say anything about what he had to offer. It's just that he heard the voice. And it was clear. And it, was only, it could only be God. And in that moment, he said, I don't want to miss this. The paradigm, the pattern that the Bible gives us about the great men of faith, those moments of redemptive history where things change forever, where the redemptive action of God healing this world really makes strides, is not about these men talent. It's not about what they have to offer. It's not about their history or what they've done. It's that they hear the voice of God. They feel the call. The moment gets big, and, and they say, I don't want to miss this. Whatever God is up to, and whatever I can do in this, I'm available. Here I am. Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, and Ananias, here I am. And the call for us is the same call. And right now is one of these big moments in this community. Because what we're about to do is we're about to open a bright white light in the middle of the Hamilton Corridor, east side of Columbus, in this city, and just because we open the doors, thousands of people are going to come. And those thousands of people are going to write new stories in this building. And everyone who's a part of the squad, everyone who's a part of the team, is, is actively involved in what God is about to do in their life. And that is a huge call. It's a huge moment. It's one of these only God, God-sized, it must be Him moments. And we can't miss this moment. We can't miss it. You know, my faith is not marked by a lot of moments like what I'm talking about. I'm a very careful person. I prepare for things. Um, I, I really like to be good at things. And more importantly than that, honestly, more unhealthy than that, I really care that other people think I'm good at things. So when I have an opportunity, I prepare for it, and I make sure I'm ready, and I make sure I have what it takes. That's my personality. Um, a year ago, uh, I went to Haiti with our kids' team to work with 117 International, who's one of our partners. And what we were doing down there is we were putting on a kids' camp for these amazing kids that go to that school. And so we went with uh, Kaylee Whipple and Dan Carr, who oversee our kids' ministry on a staff perspective. And we took some of our team members, Kayla Vizina, Caleb Harami, and Nick Kamiati, and we went down there and we put on one of these kids' camps. And I was sort of like, like moral support because I'm not that heavily involved in kids' ministry, but I was like a backup dancer and uh, I was in the skits. And on the last day, Daniel asked me to give a message, and the message was about honesty, and the bottom line was tell the truth even when it's difficult, which is an amazing thing to tell kids. And uh, I prepared for this moment, you know, because it's, it's hard to speak to kids who don't speak your language, and you're using a translator, and so you have to make sure that what you're saying uh, is easily translatable, and you have to make sure that you're pausing at the right places so that the translator can say what you're saying, and you got to try to read the kids to see if they're getting it. And so I prepared for this moment. I prepared for this talk. And sometimes before I speak, I get like very nervous. And so I'm like pacing around in the morning. And Curtis Stout, the executive director of, of 117, he pulled me aside and he said, you know, we've been talking about this as a staff and we've been praying about this and we want you to give the gospel to these kids. They're 9 to 11 years old and we've never actually had a moment where we said, you have an opportunity to give your life to Jesus right now. Do you want to take that step? And we want you to do it right now. And everything inside of me was like, no. I don't want to do that. I don't know how to do that. I mean, I've been preparing for this talk. I don't know what these kids already know. I don't know what I have to explain. I don't know if the words I say are going to be translated the way that I want to, to, to say them. Um, I, I, I don't want to do this. All my insecurities, all my instincts were like, don't do this. And one of the only times in my life, I told you this is very rare for me, I could feel the presence of God, the voice. I could feel that this was a big moment, that maybe God was about to do something big, something special in this moment. And I said, all right, I'll do it. And I stood in front of these kids, and I gave the gospel. And at the end, we had them put their heads down in case they wanted privacy, and we said, if this is the first time that you have accepted a relationship with Jesus, raise your hand. And all 35 kids raised their hand. 
And I was like, I am an amazing gospel preacher. I was like, I have been anointed by God. Uh, and I looked over at Curtis, who was kind of scratching his chin and looking at Greg, who's the principal, who was like, and I was like, they didn't understand what I was saying. They didn't get it. They, what I just tried to do, I failed. They, they don't get it. You know, like the, the purpose of standing up and communicating something is to do it clearly so that people understand. If you, if you don't do that, then like you might as well not have stood up in the first place. You made no progress. And so Greg came up and he stood next to me and he redid the part about the decision. You know, if you don't have a relationship, but now you want to start one. And 15 kids raised their hands. And they stood up and they walked to the front of the class, and all their classmates cheered for them, and some of them had tears in their eyes. And we got to pray over these kids that this was a new moment in their life, new life, a new start, a new reality. And I was like, you know, while Greg was re-explaining it in my head, I was like, man, I just did a really terrible job. Did a really bad job at this, I failed. And then when I saw that happen, it was like, man, I actually get to be a part of this really, really special moment this really special moment where 15 kids in a different country that I just met ha gave their, their life to Jesus. And, and I was here for that. I was a part of that story. And my name will be etched into their life forever. And a couple months later, Curtis sent out a, a like, newsletter. And uh, in that newsletter, he told the story of this girl. And her name is Juvelande. She goes by Joanne. And like many of the kids down there, she comes from, from a really tough situation, just abject poverty and, uh, you know, uh, voodoo religion and abuse. The abuse is so bad that the school has talked to, to officials and authorities multiple times to see if there's anything that can be done. And the story in the newsletter was about how Juvelande told her teachers that her relationship with Jesus was helping her through the pain. And that because she knew that she was loved forever by the creator of the universe, that she has hope no matter what she sees at home. And she told her friends, in a moment where they were asked to share prayer requests, she told her, her friends, her classmates, that, um, that she knows that now, because of her relationship with Jesus, that she doesn't have to be a part of these bad things in her life anymore. That she gets to escape these things that Jesus will save her, that the hope is real, that the future is bright, and she actually knows that now. And I read that newsletter, and I was like, I'm attached to that moment for the rest of my life. Nobody can ever take that away from me. Nobody can ever take that away from me. That moment is something that is etched into eternity that I got to be a part of. Now, did I do a good job? No. They didn't understand what I said. <laughs> Was I prepared? No, I said I wasn't prepared. Was I scared? Yes. Did I know what was about to be asked of me? No. But I felt the moment. And I said yes to something that I had no business saying yes to. And now, forever, I'm attached to that redemption, to that soul, to this girl. Because I didn't want to miss the moment. And I didn't miss the moment. And so here we go. If you think that that kind of life change doesn't happen at 514 Church every single week, it's just because we don't do a good enough job of sharing the stories. This type of stuff happens every week here. Every time we gather, every time the spirit moves, every time the small groups gather, every time the high schoolers gather, people take a step towards Jesus and redemption is had and healing is had and reality changes and eternity changes forever through us, through God in us. It happens every single week. And when we open the doors to a new building, the only thing that's different is that it's going to be more people, more opportunities, more stories that we get to write our names into. More people that we get to be a part of their life changing, their eternity changing, their salvation. More people, more opportunities. Come and join the squad. Come and be a part of that. Come be front and center in what God is about to do in this moment, in this big only God moment. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. We, you don't know how many of these moments you're going to get in your life. You know, a lot of us will never be a part of something like what's about to happen ever again. But we know that we have this one moment, this one opportunity, this one shot, this one door 
that we can open and we can step through into the other side in its rarefied air. The opportunity's here. The moment has come. Don't miss it. Don't miss this moment. Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much for this community of people. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to watch you move in new ways. I, I, I pray that we take the model of Abraham and Moses and Isaiah and Ananias and that we can feel what's about to happen and we can feel that it's big and we can feel that it's you and we can hear the call and that everybody in this room decides right now today that they're not going to miss it. They're not going to miss this moment. They're not going to miss what you have in store for us. We're going to step into this moment and we're going to participate because we know you're about to do something big, something huge, God. Thank you for putting this opportunity in front of us. The fact that you allow us to be a part of what you're up to and what you do should be met with so much gratitude every single day. And I just pray that this moment does not get lost on us and that everybody who's in this room and can feel the way that you're about to move, that we decide we're not gonna miss this. We put our yes on the table and we make ourselves available. Here we are, God. It's in your name we pray, amen. because many of us are, are sitting right here today because many of you in this room have uh, gone before and you've, you've done what John just talked about. You've said yes, and you've said, here I am. And it's people with servant hearts who understand that serving isn't something they have to do, but it's something that they get to do. And so many of you do that, and that's why so many of us are able to sit in this room today and be impacted by 514 Church and what God is doing. And those types of people, the here I am, uh, put my yes on the table types of people, they represent Matthew 514. They represent it. Where Jesus said these words right here, he said that you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And that's what so many people have done. They've decided uh, to take their light, so to speak, and to shine, to shine. And they shine by coming early in the dark, cold mornings and setting this place up and then staying afterwards to tear it all down. There are people who shine by spending hours making coffee or people who stand for an hour holding a screaming, squirming baby. Other people who shine by sitting in a circle with a smelly group of kindergarten boys or sixth grade boys or 10th grade boys or girls and sharing and trying to help them understand the person of Jesus is people who have done that and they've shined their lights. They have become the light of the world like Jesus instructed us so that we could see him more clearly so that you and I would have the opportunity to, uh, to impact other people and to actually understand the creator of the universe a little bit more. And so I want everyone to do something. This is participation time. I want you to take out your phone. Every single person do this because it's cooler if we all do it, okay? It's gonna be really sweet. And I want you to locate your flashlight. Locate your flashlight. And I'm gonna ask you a few questions. And if you have experienced this here at 514 Church, I want you to turn your flashlight on. So it should be dark in here right now. Turn them all off. And then I'm gonna ask you a question. And if it's happened, I want you to turn your flashlight on. If, uh, if you have ever driven into our parking lot and been uh, waved at by a smiling face who made you feel a little bit warmer inside, you know what I mean? Turn your flashlight on, if that's ever happened to you. Oh yeah. I love it. Turn them off. If you have ever been welcomed or greeted by someone who said, welcome to 514 Church, and you actually felt like they cared that you were here, turn your flashlight on. It's awesome. Uh, this is for the guilty, which I um, am in this boat. If you have ever been running a little late, and you have been saved by a hot cup of coffee or a hot cup of tea because you didn't make it at home, turn on your flashlights. Yep, that's what I thought. Turn them off. 
This is for the parents in the room. If you've ever dropped your child or student off at a 514 Kids or a Boom or a high school night ministry experience, turn your lights on. Yeah, so cool. If your child has ever come home from one of those events and shared something that they learned about the person of Jesus or shared something that impacted their faith or impacted their world in any way, turn your light on. Yeah. So cool. If you have ever sat in this room and felt the presence of God, felt something in your chest when a worship song was being sung by our incredible worship leading team, turn your light on. Yeah, it's awesome. If you have ever been changed by a word that you've heard, by a message that has been given, uh, that has impacted the way you see God, the way you see your life, the way you see others, and it impacted your Monday and your Tuesday, turn your light on. I just want you to look around the room right now because what's amazing is that uh, people have come, people have said yes, people have said here I am so that this could happen, so that impact could happen, so that lights could shine. You can turn your flashlights off. Uh, I was reminded of the power of yes and then God moving through our yeses in someone's story recently that literally uh, it brings flesh and blood and a name to everything that we've said today. And this person is Wes Martin. And if I asked if you turned on your flashlight, if you were impacted or knew Wes Martin, a lot of you would do that because Wes Martin is a light. He is a light, he shines and he is on our staff here. And his story, I was reminded of it recently, and it's so impactful and it's so cool. Wes Martin came to church um, after many years away from church, and you could even say kind of a bitter uh, taste in his mouth to church, but his son asked him to come, and so he came. And he sat right back there in that corner. And uh, he was uh, welcomed by our team member, and he was given coffee by a team member, and he sat here, and he was in awe of the music. He loved the music the message and then something happened one of the days that he came a uh, David McCreary by the grace of God just shocking that this happened but David McCreary got on stage and he asked if anyone in the room had a hundred dollar bill that he could shred okay he's up to his little magic tricks here and Wes Martin if you know anything about Wes Martin he always has some crisp cash okay so if you need some you just need to go see him later today but Wes Martin raised his hand and David McCreary went up to him and Wes gave him this $100 bill. And sure enough, David didn't end up shredding it because, you know, he does some magic trick where he doesn't end up shredding the $100 bill. And he gave it back to Wes. But something Wes talks about, something happened that day in his heart. And the truth of the matter is that David didn't really like change Wes's life that day, but something happened through David because Jesus started to move in Wes's heart and in his life that day. I guarantee people started to look at Wes Martin, who then went on a journey of really rediscovering his faith and rediscovering his relationship with God, so much so that he has led the setup and teardown team for years, and he's on our staff. He's just an incredible human. I guarantee people looked at him and have said, what happened to Wes Martin? And you know what the answer is. The answer is that David McCreary said to Jesus, here I am. I'm gonna put my yes on the table and I wanna be used by you, God. You can take my talents and you can take my gifts. You can even take some of my stupidity, God, and you can use it because God has this massive plan. Think about this. He looks at Wes Martin, he goes, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get Wes Martin and David McCreary at this church called 514 Church that meets in a school. And I'm gonna start to move into Wes's life through David McCreary, through what I have given him. I'm gonna start to somehow move so that Wes's life ends up getting impacted so that then he goes on to impact so many other people. That's what happens when we shine our lights, when we put our yes on the table. And David understood this right here, and this is so key. He understood that we don't change lives when we serve. We allow Jesus to change lives when we serve. It's not about us. 
God looks at people who are able and willing. He has from the very beginning, and he goes, I'll choose you, and I'll use you, and I'll choose you, and I'll use you, and you don't have to have it all together, and you don't have to be prepared, but what I will do is I will start to move in people's lives through you, and you better hang on because it is one of the best, most exciting rides of your life to be used by me. That's what God is up to here at 514 Church. Don't miss it. I was reminded of this. It was so beautiful in Matthew 5, 14, 16. This is in the message translation. And I love the realness sometimes of the message translation. Let me read this to you guys. It says, this is Jesus with words. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. I love that. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bears, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand shine. Hey, 514 Church, now that I've given you eight acres of land in Hamilton Quarter next to City Barbecue, you're welcome. Go and shine your light. I'm going to make sure that your lead team decides you should be white so that people can't miss you. He goes on, keep open house. Be generous with your lives. And I love this. This struck me so deeply by opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous father in heaven. By opening up to others, by us opening our lives up to others, by us shining our lights, by us serving, by us saying, yes, here I am. You'll prompt people to open up with God. That is what happened in the life of Wes Martin and so many of you who are sitting here today. It's absolutely incredible. God says, hey, if you open up your hearts, here's what happens. People will start to respond to me. Their walls will begin to break down and their priorities will start to change and their hearts will be softened and I will start to move in their lives the way that only I can. But guess what? I don't need you to change your lives. I just need you to be used by me because I wanna do something incredible in the lives of the people who come to 514 Church. This is an incredible time to be a part of it. And so we need people to commit We need people to sign up. We need team members to join the 514 squad and make this place go. Because we're gonna have a bunch of people who walk into our doors and they are going to be saying, hey, here I am. And they need to see a bunch of people who go, you know what, we are ready for you. We are ready for you. We have a message for you. We have a tone we want you to understand, and it's that God loves you so much that he wants a relationship with you that he made you. And God's looking at us and he's saying, are you ready to do that? Don't miss it. And so I wanna do something really cool. Uh, I wanna show you guys our ministry uh, areas where we need uh, new people. We need new new team members, there we go, to join the squad. And I'm gonna do this through showing you guys some pictures of our under construction building right now, okay? We're getting so close. And so this is exciting because a lot of it has changed and it looks amazing. But the first uh, team that we need to populate really heavily is our welcome team. And it starts right here, starts in the parking lot. We need people that understand that the way that they wave and the clarity in which they tell someone where to park could be the beginning of someone's life changing forever. That this right here, oh, this is an impactful position. Because we believe that we don't just park cars. No, no, we park hearts. We park souls. We park people who need to understand who Jesus Christ is. That's what we do. And so ministry, man, it starts right here in the parking lot. We need people who get that. We need people who want to stand in this beautiful hallway right here where new people are going to enter through those doors. And we need people who are gonna be all over this hallway with huge smiles on their face saying, welcome to 514 Church. We love you, you belong here. And just by the way that you stand and the way that you smile, someone understands they care about me. Walls start to break down when we do that. We need people who will get super pumped about this room right here. Because in this room right here, 
something's gonna take place and it's called the Roosevelt Coffee House. Coffee is gonna be made, oh yeah. Right here, we have our own coffee prep room. How sweet is that? And we're gonna brew Roosevelt coffee and not only is it going to taste excellent, but we get to partner with a ministry partner who's just doing incredible things that's reaching people in places that we can't in ways that we're not. When we give people a cup of coffee, right? There's so much of a wider impact. People's lives get changed not only in Columbus, but all over the world. How cool is that? We need people who get jacked up about coffee. And so welcome, we need 100 people. I'm not joking. We need 100 people who are gonna say, yes, here I am to serve on our welcome team and our coffee, our parking, our security areas. Uh, the next ministry area I am, I think I'm the most excited about, and I just admitted that on stage, so it's true. Um, for the first time ever, we are going to have a kids area that is designed to be a church, not a school, right? Kids don't have to come to school on Sunday morning anymore. I mean, that is life-changing if you're in second grade, I promise. And so we are going to have kids who gather in these rooms and who sit in these precious little purple chairs. I mean, are these cute or what? Because you better believe that we are being so intentional about every single piece that we put into these rooms that will help them experience who Jesus is. Because in these little purple chairs, I mean, this is where magic happens. I'm not kidding you. This is where the world changers, the future generation, the next leaders, they sit right here. And we have the opportunity to lead them and introduce them to the person of Jesus. We don't just sit back there and play games and pass time. No, no, no. We get to instill the purpose and the identity of Christ in God's most precious little creations. And Jesus said, right, let the little children, what do he say? Come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. That's what we get to do. Man, if you want to impact the next generation, please sign up, man, serving kids. Our future sits here. Isn't that incredible to think about? Generations to come of influence right here. And so we need tons of kids team members. We need people who are gonna check in and make anxious moms feel like we got it under control because we do. And we need people who want to teach on stage. If you can communicate creatively, if you're like, yeah, that doesn't scare me, that excites me, then you could teach in our large group space, our kindergarten through fifth grade area. And then we need small group leaders. We need people who will circle up, circle up and start to invest in the next generation. So impactful. Uh, this room is incredible. Check this out. This is our student room. Yeah, baby. And this is an incredible space. It's huge. It doesn't really look all that big, but that room right there is just a little bit smaller than the gym that we're in right now. 86% um, of people who come to faith do so by the age of 15. So what happens in this thankful padded walled room for those middle schoolers, man? I mean, this is incredible. This is incredible. It's the next generation. It's people who need, uh, uh, you know, basically to say the same things that their parents are saying, but they're just not their parents. The kids listen. My prop for this is a set of keys because in middle school, what you do, and we need people who want to do this, serve in this way is you come alongside a middle schooler and, and you basically drive them around still. You pack their car with the foundations of faith and you lead them and you help them and you guide them. And then in high school, you start to hand the keys over and you go, okay, your turn now. Your turn to drive. And then you sit in the passenger seat, hopefully with an emergency brake. I wish I had one of those whenever I'm in the car with my husband. And you sit there and, and you, you start to watch them, right? Do their thing, but you're still there. 
You're there to guide them. You're there to help them. You're there to, you know, uh, be the phone call on a bad night. You're there to help them when they veer off the path. And then eventually you step out of the car and you go, okay, I hope you're gonna go in the right direction. This is a front row seat to incredible influence in the next generation. And we need tons of student leaders. Uh, We need a check-in team that's gonna welcome our students into this new space. We're so excited to see new student faces just simply because of the location we are. We think God's gonna just blow our minds in this way. And so we need a whole welcome team, a check-in team, and then we need tons of small group leaders for sixth grade all the way through 12th grade. Last but not least, uh, this room right here, this is the main auditorium and it's amazing and there's the back of it we got some stadium seating that someone's standing on and in this room oh man I can't imagine what God will do in this room and I know one of the things that he will use because that's what God does he'll use these things right here this is a Mac mini which I learned about today I don't understand how it's a computer but it's a computer even though it doesn't have a screen And we're gonna use these all over this room right here. And we're gonna use a bunch of different tech equipment and way better sounding uh, mics and way better looking lights. And we're gonna do that and we need people who care about doing that. Because you know what is really amazing is sometimes God moves in a distraction-less arena. Sometimes we have to be quiet enough to hear the voice of God in our lives. And there's so many times where so many of you have sat in here and you've been able to hear something or see something or be affected by a song that you heard because there were no distractions. And there's a team that's dedicated to making sure that the voice of God is the loudest thing in this room. And we need people who care about doing that. You go, I don't know how to work a computer. That's okay. Ryan Donovan can train you to do anything. I mean it. He's magic. So we need people to join our creative team, our production team who sits right back there, uh, our worship team. If you can sing, if you can play an instrument, we need people who are skilled in photography or graphic design or video. We need people who are all in, who say, I want to do this. I want to step up to the plate because God is moving. And man, we better get going. We better jump on the train. And so I want everyone in here to do something. I want you to stand up right now. And I want you to pull out your phone. And Joel told me to be very authoritative. And so I am going to do my very best. Every single person in this room needs to serve. Every single one of you. When we do this, something incredible happens. People experience life change through Jesus, through us. And so there's a number on this screen and I want everyone to pull out your texting messaging field. And even if you serve, maybe you go, you know what, I I can serve more because we have opportunities of once a month, twice a month, every single week and in between, we have tons of opportunities. So maybe you say, you know what, I lead a small group, but I can welcome people twice a month. And that would be incredible. And so text this number 614 656-2012. And in this text, as in the beautiful example over there, we need your name, we need your email address, and then we need your team name that you would like to serve in. And maybe you have questions, that's okay, put something down, and one of our team members will get in touch with you. Welcome kids, students, creatives. I just wanna encourage all of you as John said, to just not miss this moment. Man, God is about to do something incredible. Do we believe that? Does this room believe that? That God is about to do something incredible and he wants to use us. He says, will you please open up your heart to me? Because when you do that, people will start to respond. People will start to see me. People start to be open to who I am and the love that I have for them. And so I want this number to be in your phone. If you go, I don't know where I want to serve, just put something down. We'll reach out to you. Because something big is going to happen. We believe that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. We really do. We believe that. 
We believe that it is time for this church to come together and say, here I am to put our yes on the table and watch God move like never before because we believe this about our God. We believe that our God can move mountains. And we believe that our God, he takes prison walls and he breaks through them and he breaks them down. We believe that our God, he revives, he restores, he redeems our broken pieces, our broken hearts, our broken lives. He makes our dreams come to reality. We believe that he's a God when there's no way, he says, no, there is a way that he has more power than any other power because this is true right here. There's nothing that I God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Let's go. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I God can't do. Let's sing it out. Here we go. There's nothing that I God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise together this morning. Let's sing boldly. We've got a lot to be excited about. You guys doing amazing things and he's not done. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Just one word, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move. Go praise the name. In just one word, you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. In just one touch. Claim it. Sing it out. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus, I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus, let faith
back to next week. Can you hear me? I want to invite you back next week. Check it out really quick on the screen. Five years ago, as a church community, we started something that was called We Can't. And it was a faith journey. It was a giving initiative where we basically said, God, unless you do something big, it's not going to happen. We can, but you can. And so the next two weeks, we're going to finish this sentence, we can't, but, because God has moved. That's right. God has done things. And so we're going to celebrate that next week. Have a great week. We'll see you then.